Uh, open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Our text this morning is in chapter 3, beginning in verse 5 through verse 15. I want you to keep your Bibles open. We will read that passage in just a couple of moments. Um, want to go to the next slide there, Brother Eric, if you will, one more. Keep on going, keep on going, and stop right there. This is the Basilica e Temple uh, Expiatori de la Sagrada Familia. That's as close as I can come to it, anyways. This is located in Barcelona, Spain. And thankfully, it's also known as that big cathedral down the street, uh, or by, by the Sagrada Familia um, name. It is the largest Catholic cathedral still under construction. Construction began on March the 19th, 1882, and they're still working on it. Uh, they have announced that they anticipate completion in 2026, so not too many more uh, years from now. And if they do finish in 2026, they will have taken 144 years to build this cathedral. Now, the Sagrada Familia is by no means the longest construction of a cathedral. Um, the Milan Cathedral, next slide please, in Milan, Italy took 579 years to build. Its construction began in 1386, and it was not finished until 1965. But it's only third on our list of the longest construction projects of a cathedral. The next slide is the St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague, Czechoslovakia. And it took 585 years to build. Its construction began in 1344, and it was not finished until 1929. But it's only second on our list. The winner goes to the Cologne Cathedral in Cologne, Germany, and you see a picture of it there. It took 632 years to build. Its construction began in 1248 and was finished in 1880. Obviously, they didn't have Builders for Christ teams back in those days. They had to crank that baby out real quick. Now, actually, these cathedrals were built before the invention of modern machinery modern building practices, and that's one of the reasons why it took so long for these cathedrals to be built. But there's another common denominator among these four buildings that I want to call your attention to, and it's this. The men who began the building project were not the men who completed the building project. Now that kind of goes without saying, but think about this. That's also true in church work, okay? It's very rare that one man or woman is going to oversee a project, do all of the work of that project, and see it from start to completion. We all play our part in the work of God's kingdom. Now, a healthy church always has a broad participation of its membership in the work of that church. In fact, one of the signs of a uh, dysfunctional church is when very few people in the church are involved in the ministry of that church. Now, dysfunctional leadership is not necessarily dysfunctional from the top down. Dysfunctional leadership can also be from the bottom up, and that's really probably what was going on in the church at Corinth. Um, the church at Corinth was dysfunctional because the people in that church were divided over their leadership. Oh, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow, you know, whatever, okay? When, when that is our attitude, the church is divided, and a divided church is always a weak church. Now, I still hope you have a copy of God's Word in your hands. Let's read this passage together. Beginning in verse 5, here's what the Holy Spirit says to us this morning. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to, the, to God's grace that was given to me, I laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay any other foundation that, that, or than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that has been built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved but only as through fire. Now, one of the problems that the Corinthian church had was that the people of that church were divided because of the leader or over the leadership in that church. Um, to correct this sin, Paul offers two analogies. He offers an agricultural analogy. And then he offers an architectural analogy. And we'll look at both of those in turn, but first I want to show you something about two important truths about Christian leaders. Two important truths about Christian leaders. First of all, Christian leaders are only servants of Christ and are not to be accorded allegiance reserved for God alone. Let me say that again. Christian leaders are only servants of Christ and are not to be accorded allegiance reserved for God alone. When leaders fail to serve Christ, that is a sure sign of dysfunctional leadership from the top bop down. And when the church family gives undue praise to its leadership, that is another sign of dysfunction within the church, but in this case it's from the bottom up. Now, Isaiah 42, 8 says this, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. In other words, God is not going to share his glory with mere man. Glory is reserved for God alone. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with saying thank you to somebody in the church who does something that, that blesses you, okay? Don't be afraid to thank your Bible teacher or to thank a, a deacon or somebody who does something that you appreciate. That's being nice. That's being courteous. Um, but having said that, we must be very careful not to give allegiance to that individual because that allegiance, our allegiance belongs to God alone. Second thing I want you to understand about church leaders is that God cares about his church and he holds its leaders accountable for how they build it. The men and women who are asked to serve God, <clears throat> excuse me, in a leadership position in our church or any other church do a sacred work. It is the greatest honor to serve God. Leaders need to always remember that God is going to hold them accountable for the work that they do. This is true for the leaders in the church, but it's also true for uh, the non-leader who's not really doing anything. God is watching over every single one of us. And one day, we will all give an account of our lives uh, to God for the work or the lack of work that we do in his name. When a church has dysfunctional leadership, for whatever reason, the answer to that problem is found in verse 6. I want you to look in your Bibles with me again at verse 6. Paul writes this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
if you're a leader in our church, do not think more highly of yourself or your service to God than you should. If you are not a leader, do not think more highly of those who lead than you should. Now, having stated that, uh, that the answer to the division is found in this verse, Paul moves into his agricultural analogy to, to prove his point. All right? Here's what he says in verse 7 and 8. So then, neither the one who plants, that would have been Paul, nor the one who waters, that would have been Apollos, is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So let's think about this agricultural analogy for, for a couple of minutes. I want to go back to verse 6, because there's two important truths I want you to understand in verse 6 that lay the foundation for this agricultural analogy. First of all, different leaders serve with diff different roles. We're not all called to be pastors. We're not all called to be deacons. We're not all called to be you know, in the praise band. We're not all called to, to go on the mission trip. We're not all called to, to serve in the way somebody else might be serving. But I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, God has a place of service for you. And he is asking each one of us to find that place of service and to begin serving. So recognize that even though I am your pastor and I preach God's word and I make visits and do all the other things that a pastor does, I'm not any better than the deacons. I'm not any better than the committee workers. I'm not any better than um, Bible teachers. I just serve in a specific way. Figure out where your way is and get busy. All right, second thing I want you to see here is that only God causes the growth, all right? You know, if you think about Paul, if there is a single line up in heaven, he's at the front. I mean, he, he wrote half of the New Testament. He planted churches all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, he tried to evangelize the emperor of Rome. Um, he, he did great things in the name of Christianity. But Paul never grew a single church. That wasn't his job. Paul planted those churches, but it's God who gave those churches growth. I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, it's not my job to grow this church. It's not your job either. That's a job God has reserved for himself. The thing is, though, when you and I are doing the work that God has called us to do, whether it be um, going on a mission trip or picking up a piece of trash or whatever it is, when you're doing your job well, God is honored. And that is the church that God works through to, to spread his kingdom here on earth. All right? So God is the one who gives growth. Now, having said that, let me point out three things from this agricultural analogy. First of all, glory goes to God, not to your church leaders. Yeah, it's okay to say thank you, but give God the glory. I hope you came here this morning to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to hear my sermon. You don't need to hear the music that um, Steve picked out that Tommy's leading us in. We need Christ. We need Christ in our life. We need to worship and glorify and honor him above all others. So bring the glory to God. This is in, you know, what he says, excuse me, in verse 7. Let me read this verse again just to remind you what it says. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Imagine Paul saying that. But he does. But only God who gives the growth. Therefore, glorify God. Second thing I want you to see out of this agricultural analogy is that every leader will be rewarded for his or her work. Again, look at verse 8. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 
Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in detail at the end of this message, but I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the work that you do, God's taking notes. I like to think, I don't think it's biblical, but I kind of like to think in the back of my warped mind sometimes that God's got an angel assigned to Jim Edmondson, and my angel... Um, is, is taking notes. I think my angel's name is Hank. I don't know why I say that, but anyways, you know, it's just a gl glorified name. Anyway, never mind. When I do something well, he writes that down. When I do something stupid, he writes that down. And from time to time, my angel goes to Jesus and gives a report of my ministry. Now, obviously, God's taking a lot better notes than any angel could. But my point simply is this. God's watching you. God knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you should be doing but are not doing. And we will be rewarded at the end of time for the work that we do. You know, I have a little bit more to say about that in just a few minutes. Last thing I want you to see out of this agricultural analogy, and you really kind of have to read the whole passage here, verses 7 and 8, and I'm not going to take the time to do that again, but Paul is talking about teamwork. Church leadership is a team effort. It's not a solo act, okay? We've got to be working together. Anybody in here ever shoot a bow and arrow? You, did? you guys like doing it? I, I honestly thought for a while, a couple years ago, about possibly taking that up as a hobby, but uh, arrows fall to the ground, and I don't pick things up off the ground too well because of... Well, you guys understand. But here's the thing about arrows. Every arrow basically has the same parts. You've got the arrow head, you have the shaft, and then you've got the feathers at the end. All right? Now, if you think about this, we are all part of the arrow. All right? We are all supposed to be doing our part. What is the arrow head? What is its purpose? It is to drive the arrow into its target. What is the purpose of Elders Baptist Church? Now we have a unique purpose statement which is to fulfill the great commission as given to us by Jesus Christ our Lord. But what is the great commission? Can you say it with me? Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now here's the thing. That arrow, when it's shot by a skilled archer, is going to strike its point, and it's going to drive the, into its target. That's what we ought to be doing with the Great Commission Everybody doing our part as part of the, that arrow, whether you be in the shaft or the feathers or whatever it is. But here's the thing. Everybody knows what the spokes of a wheel look like on a bicycle. You know how those spokes are going off in different directions? Now, obviously, from an engineer's perspective, that's necessary for the, the bicycle wheel to work. But that is a bad business model when you have a church because different projects going in different directions do not support each other as a church. We need to be like that arrow, moving in the right direction together. This is why I say we are a team effort, not a solo act. Now, Paul uses verse 9 as a transitional statement from the agricultural analogy into the architectural analogy. And he writes this in verse 9. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. And then he moves in in verses 10 and 11 into the second analogy, and he writes this. According to, the, to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go back and look at verse 9 before we get into this analogy in detail. First of all, 
this is, he, I want to give you a word of caution here about Paul's statement that we are God's co-workers. All right? Paul is not saying that we are on the same level of God. Paul is not saying that the work that I do, the work that you do, is on the same level as the work that God does. He is not saying that. What Paul is saying here is that God is at work. And we need to be working with God. It is a mistake for a local church to come before Almighty God and say, Here is our ministry, bless it, Father. Instead, what we need to be doing is prayerfully seeking God's face and finding out where God is already at work and building our ministries to come alongside of him, to serve him. So be careful about under, you know, misunderstanding this, this statement here. Second thing about verse 9 is that the whole church is God's field. Again, this is a transitional statement. Um, Paul is looking back to what he's just written. He's saying that we are God's field, um, wheat field, corn field, uh, whatever kind of crop you want to think about. This is the way you and I are. And if you've ever grown up on a farm or you've ever watched a farm show, you know that you know, the farmers get up early and they do their thing. They, they plant the crops. They you know, weed the, the, the fields. They do all the things that farmers have to do. But ultimately, who's the one who gives the plants growth? Mike, you're right. It's God. Okay? But then God shifts his anal or excuse me, Paul shifts his analogy and he says that the whole church is God's building. This is where the, or excuse me, the architectural analogy begins here. Uh, yes, we're a field, but we're also a building if you want to think of it in those terms. And let me give you three things about this excuse me, architectural analogy. Number one, our ability to serve God comes from God's grace. Paul may have been one of the smartest individuals who ever lived. He was a brilliant man. But he understood that the success of his ministry, of his planting churches, was dependent upon the grace of God. And wise is the man or woman in the local church today that realizes it's the same thing even today. That it's the grace of God. It's not based on my ability to create, you know, fancy sermons. It's not on your ability to, to serve in whatever way that you serve. It's ultimately the grace of God who's working through us. So recognize that our ability to serve God comes, first of all, from God's grace. Second of all, Paul says that he laid the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. He calls himself a master builder. He was a tent maker. Maybe he had learned some skills about building buildings. And when I used to go on the Builders for Christ trips, I, I loved watching the guys and the girls who really knew, knew how to build. That's a skill I wish I had. Um, I, I don't, and unfortunately, but it's fun to watch people who know what they're doing. But Paul says, ultimately, his, the foundation that he laid is Jesus Christ. Now, friends, I hope you came today to worship Jesus. I hope you didn't come to hear my sermon. Again, I hope you didn't come to hear the music that Steve's prepared and that Tommy's been leading us in. Because this is a time for God. This is a time when God's people come together. We join our hearts and our voices together and we lift up Jesus Christ above all others. And if we try to build this church on anything other than Christ, we will surely stumble and fall. Sadly, there's been a lot of um, accounts in recent months of... Um, Churches of, of mega church or pastors of mega churches, I'm trying to say, that have fallen. They've stumbled in their ministry because of moral sin, because they took their eyes off of Christ and put it on themselves. 
let's keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and build on him. One more thing about this agricultural analogy, or excuse me, architecture, I keep saying agriculture. Paul says others build on Paul's work. Paul planted the church at Corinth, but after he left, Apollos came in, and Apollos was a pastor teacher. He was the man who God used to begin equipping the, the church in Corinth and to helping them to grow and to understand what they needed to be doing. And this is the way Paul worked. He would go into a community and he'd plant a church there and then he would move on somewhere else and somebody would come in behind him to build up that church, to strengthen that church. Ladies and gentlemen, one day, I'm not going to be your pastor. Just making sure there wasn't any amens on that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, watch it, Charlie. There's going to come a day through my death, through um, retirement, through disability. I won't be your pastor. But think about it in these terms. God's already preparing the next pastor of Elders Baptist Church, even though his ministry is still a long ways off. And I didn't realize it at the time, but God was preparing me for the day when Pastor Kenny Heath would leave this church to go out to Western Maryland to be a, a, an associational missionary out there. For you see, my friends, pastors come and pastors go. Same thing's true with deacons. Very few of the deacons serving right now were deacons when I first came here 23 years ago. Bible teachers come and go. People singing in the choir or a praise band come and go. And the point is this, that do your work well, but recognize that one day somebody's going to take your place. And somebody's going to say, wow, Brother Charlie, he did a great job in this ministry, and I'm so happy to be following in his footsteps. Or you know, that person might say, wow, what did Charlie do? I can't figure this out. Just picking on Charlie. He's a great guy. But my point is simply this. You and I are going to die. You and I are going to retire. You and I are going to move away. You and I are going to do something that will cause the, the work that we're doing in this church our work to stop but God will pick up the pieces with somebody else and will continue moving forward with his work through elders Baptist Church it's not my ministry it's not your ministry it's God's ministry and he's gonna see it through now it is important that we recognize that this passage here is not just about church leaders today Leaders have a, re, a unique responsibility before God, that is true. But all Christians will one day stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of their life to him. Now let me pause right now because this freaks out a lot of Christians, but let me explain something to you. I'm going to do it in the way of a question. What did God do with your sin when Jesus died on the cross for you at Calvary? What did God do with your sin? Two things. He forgave it, and he forgot it. You know what man does? When somebody sins against us, we'll say, yes, I forgive you, brother, but I'm going to write it down and keep it in my back pocket and remember it. Sadly, that's what we do, don't we? We shouldn't, but that's what we do. But what God does when he forgave your sin is he also forgets it. He wipes the slate clean. He declares us innocent. It's like it never happened whatsoever. So then, when we stand in judgment before Christ and give an account of our lives to him, our sins will play no role in that judgment because it was dealt with at Calvary. And God has forgotten it. Well, we're still going to be judged. What about? Well, God's going to judge us for the things that we do of eternal value. 
In fact, there's really, there's two judgments, and I, I want to delineate these before I get into each one of them. The first judgment is called the Bema Seat Judgment by a lot of scholars today. It's not really the term used here, but um, the Bema Seat Judgment is for Christians. If you're a Christian, this is the one you're going to go to. All right. The other one is the Great White Throne Judgment. If you're a Christian, you will not even see the Great White Throne Judgment. It is reserved only for non-Christians. Now let's back up to the Bema Seat Judgment for a minute here, okay? You know, in the ancient Olympics, when a man would run his race or do the wrestling or whatever it was that he did, and he'd win his event, he would then be taken before the judges who sat at the Bema Seat. This is where this term comes from, okay? There the judges would declare that he had run the race according to the rules, and therefore he is to be awarded the victor's wreath. They, they had the, you probably have seen the little laurel that they wear on their heads. All right, that's the victor's wreath there, okay? They didn't do the gold and silver and bronze medals like we do today, all right? So by announcing that they ran the race according to the rules and that they rightly deserved the, um, the award, it would then be given to them. Now, as Christians, we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account of our lives to him. Um, the, Paul says here, let me find it here in verse 12, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, stray, or, or wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Now what happens when you put gold into fire? Anybody? It melts the fire, or excuse me, it melts the, the, the metal and dross, the impurities rise to the top so that they, it can be wiped away. All right? Well, this is in essence what's going to happen as we stand before Christ to give an account of our lives. The things that we have done in this life are going to be touched with fire. And um, that which is of eternal value, that which is glorifying and honorable to God, is going to be purified. And you know what happens when wood, hay, and straw is touched with fire. It burns up. It's gone. It's lost. All right? Here's what's going to happen, my friends. When you stand before Christ and give an account of your life and he touches you with fire, and again, this is an analogy. It's not literal, but when he you know, does this, the purified gold and silver and precious stones are going to appear at your feet. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will understand at that moment that it was Christ doing those things through you. And you will sweep up those things in your hands and you will walk to the Savior and you'll kneel down and worship before him and you'll lay them at his feet as an act of worship. This is the beam of seat worship the beam of seat judgment that we're going to uh, give an account of our lives to Christ. Now, obviously, some people will have a lot of gold, a lot of silver, a lot of precious stones to worship Christ in. And some people are going to have their lot, uh, the account of their lives burned up with hay, um, wood, and straw. And though you will still be in heaven because you're saved by God's grace, not your works, you will have little to worship Christ with at that moment. The second judgment, if you're in Christ, you'll never see it. So you Christians can take a nap for the next three minutes, and I'll wake you up when, when I'm done here. But this is reserved for the non-Christian, the man or woman, boy or girl, who has rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior. John writes about the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15, he says this, And then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. 
Then he gave, or excuse me, then the sea gave up the dead that were in them, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Here's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Death and hell. And John, who's on the island of Patmos, says even the sea are going to give up its dead. And one at a time, they're going to stand before Christ. Notice in here, there's no defense. There's no arguments. The time of defending your actions is over with. Jesus is going to take the book of life. I've got a Bible here, but let's pretend it's the book of life. And he's going to open it up. He's going to look for your name. And he's not going to find it. And there's some other books that John mentions. He doesn't tell us what, they're, what they are. But I suspect Jesus is going to open up those books as well. And he'll look for your name. And he won't find it. And then Jesus is going to say to the lost, one at a time, depart from me. I never knew you. What is the mark of our salvation? It is a relationship with God. Going on the Builders for Christ trip does not save you. Coming to a worship service doesn't save you. Being baptized does not save you. What saves us is the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And for the lost one after another, Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me into the lake of fire. For that lake of fire is the second death, as John says. And that will be the place of eternal torment for those who have rejected Jesus Christ. If you're a leader in our church, serve the Lord with gladness. Recognize your job's not better than anybody else's. And you're taking a, a job that was done by somebody else earlier, and somebody will eventually take your job. But for right now, serve the Lord with gladness. Recognize what a privilege and an honor it is to serve in some way in God's house of worship. Don't limit your service to God, though, just here in this building. This is a great place to get your batteries recharged, but when you go out into your highways, when you go out into your neighborhoods, when you go to the restaurants and to the businesses, we're on mission there also, friends. Tell people about Jesus. Do the work that God's called us to do. It is the the work of every Christian to take the message of Jesus Christ to Eldersburg, to Maryland, to North America, and to the ends of the earth. And we need to serve the Lord where he plants you. And until our queen locks the casket door on you, find a place of worship, or excuse me, find a place of service and serve him faithfully.